Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois, along with Jim Baltz, Instructional Design Specialist. And today we're going to discuss aflatoxin and microtoxin risks. These have been the three major concerns with drought stress corn here in the U.S., low quality feed, nitrates, and now the new risk is the appearance of aflatoxin. Well, aflatoxin is, is a fungi from the aspergillus group that produces aflatoxin. The real problem is aflatoxin is a cancer-causing agent, both in humans and animals. The aflatoxin comes from a mole that colonizes on the corn kernel caused by ear rot or ear mole, which kind of opens up the ear for that risk and that to grow. Any condition that encourages mole growth, such as wet conditions, would be a problem. The mold is an olive green in color, and we'll see that here in just a minute. So what's the big concern primarily with dairy cattle and lactating dairy cows? FDA has ruled that any milk over 0.5 parts per billion cannot be used for human consumption. It is not, cannot be manufactured. Second of all, cows tend to excrete anywhere from 1 to 2 percent of consumed aflatoxin in milk. And certainly that will vary from cow to cow. So therefore, rations over 20 parts per billion times 2% ends up with that value of 0.4, which is very close to the cutoff value. So as cows vary in the ration, certainly this can be a concern. This slide comes from Purdue University, which indicates a very nice picture of what you might see out there in your fields. They recommend inspecting at least 10 ears in several locations and probably picking those locations that are more at risk, uh, dry areas, areas where cobs are open, things like that. Peel back the husks and look for this olive green mold color, as you can see on the right side over here. This mold will appear powdery and may disperse like a dust when the husk is pulled back. Here are some numbers to look at for livestock. You can see lactating dairy cows at 20 parts per billion for lactating dairy animals. For breeding animals, which include beef, swine, and dairy, under 100 parts per billion in the total ration dry matter. Uh, swine, growing, finishing swine, 200 parts per billion, and beef steers at 300 parts per billion. So it provides some flexibility in terms of which animals can be targeted to utilize some of these corn products. This slide simply looks for dairy specific. We see aflatoxin on top, and of course that is for lactating dairy animals at this point. We also list some other microtoxins that can pop up from year to year depending on growing conditions and field conditions. Don or vomitox, uh, under six parts per million. Notice that word million. Uh, T2 toxin, 100 parts per billion. And xerolinone, 300 parts per billion. So again, be, every year have different challenges out there in the field. Signs for microtoxicity in uh, dairy cattle are listed here, probably applied to other livestock species as well. The real one big concern is immune suppression. Cattle do not respond well to disease challenges. A rheumatoid disorders can occur, especially at higher levels. You may see a difference in fecal discharge, cows being looser or animals being looser. It may reduce dry matter intake, which, perform, which impacts performance, it can be over two pounds per cow per day, and it can have some hormone-like changes depending on which microtoxin it is, which can lead to utter development, reduced fertility, and other relationships. So one of the concerns is on the milk itself. So strategies if milk is high in aflatoxin. Obviously, you want to test your feeds to determine which feed or feeds. Notice the word plural. It could be more than one feed. It could be corn, corn sage, fuzzy cotton seed, or other corn products. It is the at-risk feed. So we need to determine which feeds are the potential problem. Then I would remove that feed from the cow immediately or from the herd. A milk can clear in terms of low levels of aflatoxin within 48 hours. So the point is to get the cows off that feed and the milk available to be marketed again. So certainly a number of milk co-ops will monitor your milk weekly or some testing labs to be sure it is safe and wholesome. So if we do have aflatoxin contaminated corn grain or corn silage, notice the word silage there, a number of strategies are possible. The first one is to dilute down with what I call wholesome forages and grains. This could be alfalfa, it could be barley, it could be commercial protein supplements, could be soy hulls, for example, like a byproduct feed. Another alternative is to add an additive or flow agent, more about that in just a minute. We could ammoniate the corn, more about that in a minute as well, and also be well aware that some of the corn byproducts can actually raise or bring aflatoxin to the diet. The mycotoxin binders, and actually we, legally they're called flow agents, uh, there are two general types or three. First are the clay-based products such as the bentonites, the, the zeolites, the calcium aluminosilicates, and these will usually work well with aflatoxin. So if this is the year for aflatoxin, the levels you can see vary depending on the type of product that you're going to be feeding. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines on that. The yeast cell wall extracts are also a good microtoxin binder, also known as moss agents or glucomannans, 
and they are more effective on some of the other microtoxins we talked about earlier, such as the T2 and xerolinone. There's also an enzyme product out there as well, or products that can basically deal with these uh, toxins as well. The inclusion rates are lower. Sometimes you'll double or triple to tie this up and go forward to get the levels down. These products do not impact and appear in the milk. Ammoniation, this is some work from Ted Funk at the University of Illinois, looking at what you can do with ammoniation. What the ammonia does is breaks the ring structure, so it is destroys uh, the, uh, the structure of the aflatoxin. Ideally, the, we need to have moisture and heat to cause this chemical reaction to go, and that's exactly what's going to happen. So certainly sealing that in bags or bins and then putting the ammonia in can be a plus. The level of ammonia will vary, according to Ted, depending on the concentration of aflatoxin in there, a 0.5 to 1.5%. Uh, some farmers are you an aqua ammonia product. Be well aware, however, you need to go higher levels because there is a lower concentration of ammonia in those products. Those products would probably be safer to handle. The corn will darken in color. It will caramelize the sugar, and as a result, can only be fed to livestock at this point. You may need to aerate that feed also because of some palatability problems. Usually, this product cannot be sold across state lines, and certainly the handling of uh, anhydrous ammonia is very, very dangerous and must be carefully done. Quick word on the byproduct feeds. If corn is high in, in microtoxin, or in this case, aflatoxin, so will the byproduct feeds. Corn distillers will typically be three times higher than the original level aflatoxin in the corn. So if your corn was 10 parts per billion, the distiller's grains could end up being 30 parts per billion, which is over that magic number by FDA of 20 parts per billion. Also, corn gluten feed, hominy, and fuzzy cotton seed can contain uh, the aflatoxin as well. So what are some of the management considerations besides looking at the feeding ones we talked about earlier? Obviously, testing is always a challenge. And my dairymen are very frustrated because they'll see their milk being challenged or not being able to be marketed, and yet the feed numbers are very low. Be well aware, very difficult to sample when you're looking at uh, 20 parts per billion in, in, in a sample of corn or feedstuff on the farm. Number two, don't store wet corn this year that has aflatoxin associated with it as high moisture corn. Uh, it's a wonderful environment to grow the, the aflatoxin. So we're recommending to dry it down. Uh, go ahead and shell it, dry it down, get below 14% moisture according to Ted Funk. Be well aware that uh, wet corn could be due to rain and, uh, or maturity of the corn, and certainly warm weather favor aflatoxin development. So we're seeing some warmer temperatures in the fall and maybe some rain returning. That, that could actually be bad news as far as aflatoxin development in the field. Obviously, screen out the fines and broken particles because generally speaking, this is where the, uh, the, uh, the molds are going to attach and attack as far as that goes. And of course, you certainly want to clean up the equipment after harvest. This is a Purdue guideline primarily because you don't want to have it transferred into other fields, other crops later on in the season. Another point from Purdue is certainly be well aware this can be uh, very debilitating to you, the person harvesting. Uh, wearing a respirator, certainly to remove the, the fine dust would be a plus with aflatoxin. To removing and changing, washing clothes after handling this suspect grain. If you do not feel well after handling grain, you should go see a doctor and alert him to what's been going on there. And of course, uh, be very careful when the feed out conditions here. Because of the moisture and the mold development in there, you could have some uh, blocked flow, cavities, crusting, grain avalanche trapping you. So there's certainly a human concern on this area as well when we talk about molds and corn. So the take-home messages for dairy producers, certainly monitor milk aflatoxin levels to protect your milk supply and consumer confidence. I think that's a critical value here. Uh, consumers are going to start wondering, well, if there's aflatoxin out there, how do I know my children are not drinking that milk? When you look at an aflatoxin test on your farm, the one that's always right is the milk. The grains, the sizes can be quite hard to evaluate. Tests of feeds to determine risk, but be well aware of the concerns we just mentioned. And finally, there are strategies that you can reduce the levels in milk in your feed and exposure to your cattle. There are other resources available that you can go to. Purdue has an excellent uh, website where you can look at and read some of this fine material here. You can come to the University of Illinois Extension to their drought stress resources, and here's a website to go there as well if you want to follow up with more information. So certainly come and check us out here at the University of Illinois. Check out, we have online dairy classes. The URL is listed there as well. And of course, much of this information is on our website called Illini Dairy Net. Well, thanks. Have a good day.